Now, what about the next election? Well, the next election is, oh, I should say, you probably know this, but if you don't, I'll say it, that the masters understand exactly what's going on. So after the 2008 election, uh, Obama won a prize from the advertising industry, public relations industry. He won, they give an annual award for the best marketing campaign of the year. And Obama won the award in 2008. He beat out Apple Computer. And if you look at the business press, the uh, business executives were euphoric. They said, this is, you know, they said we've been marketing candidates like uh, toothpaste ever since Reagan, and this is the best we've ever done. You know, it's going to change the atmosphere in corporate boardrooms. It was incredible. Uh, what happens in 2012? Well, you know, ever since the 70s, the cost of election has been rising very fast, and that has an effect. It drives um, the, the parties uh, deep into the pockets of corporate America. That's where the money is. But for the Republicans, it's like reflexive, not even a problem. Uh, the Democrats have a somewhat more diffuse constituency, not that different. But uh, by now, the Democrats, so-called, are what used to be called moderate Republicans. If you read, say, Eisenhower, he would be somewhere way out on the left today, literally. Uh, but the Democrats are what used to be called moderate Republicans. They've disappeared, and they're following the same path. Actually, Obama is exactly the same. He's, uh, he's got a big concern right now, how to get reelected. The next election is predicted to cost about $2 billion. That's uh, monstrous. And there's only one place where you can find a you know, billion dollars. And you look at his appointments, that's exactly the, what they reflect. I mentioned earlier that in his economic team, they were almost all uh, people who created the crisis. There was, in fact, one exception, uh, Paul Folker. Folker was Reagan's Secretary of the Treasury, but the spectrum has shifted so far to the right that he was the leftist in the Obama administration. He was the one person who was calling for uh, some sort of regulation, you know, breaking up the big banks and stuff like that. Well, about a couple of months ago, he was dismissed, replaced by Jeffrey Immelt, the CEO of General Electric. Uh, uh, Immelt's job, the job assignment for him, was to create jobs. Uh, there's something I have to understand about the English language, if I can go off into the other part of my brain. Uh, there's an unpronounceable word, an obscene word in English. Uh, I have to spell it. There might be children in the crowd. It's uh, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. You're not allowed to say that. The way that word is pronounced is jobs. So when you ever hear a, literally, you hear a political leader saying, you know, this is a job-killing bill or we got to get jobs and so on, you have to translate it. You can't say it. It's obscene. You have to translate it. So Imelt is put in there to get jobs. Uh, how's he going to get jobs? Why GE? Uh, well, uh, Obama pointed out, look, this is the biggest corporation in the U.S., but it happens that uh, more than half of its workforce is abroad, and most of its profits come up from abroad, and by now it's mostly a financial corporation. I mean, it does still make light bulbs, but most of what it's done is, uh, is financial, it does is financial manipulations. Uh, and of course, when it collapses, as it does periodically in the crises, you bail it out. Uh, so that's where we're going to get the jobs, not from Folker, the residue of the left-wing Reagan administration, which we now have to <laughs> dispense with. Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, there's one general point about all this, which I, I'll finish with this. Uh, there's a, if you studied and took an economics course, uh, you learn that uh, there's a couple of things you learn. Uh, one thing you learn is that markets, which are a marvelous thing, are based on uh, informed consumers making rational choices. Uh, most of you have, say, looked at a television program, I guess, and you've seen ads. I mean, is an ad trying to create an informed consumer who will make a rational choice? I mean, just ask yourself. Uh, you're not supposed to notice this when you take your economics course. Uh, if we had a market system, anything like it, then an ad would be a description of the, of the characteristics of the product. 
It would be like what you read in Consumer's Report. Consumer Report. That's obviously not what an ad is. It's trying to delude you into making an irrational choice based on lack of information. And in fact, the goal of one of the major goals of business is to undermine markets by creating irrational consumers who will make uninformed uh, uninformed consumers will make irrational choices. Well, when the same institutions want to destroy democracy, they do exactly the same thing. When they run elections, which are now run by the PR uh, agencies, they want to make sure that you have uninformed voters making irrational choices. And you take a close look at electoral campaigns, and you can see that that's exactly what's happening. Same techniques are used to undermine democracy that are used to undermine markets. Now, there's another thing you learn in an economics course. Uh, there's, there are fundamental market inefficiencies. You learn them in every f first course. Uh, one of them is what's called externalities, the things that are not taken into consideration when you make a transaction. So like if, say, you sell me a car and we've got our eyes open, uh, we make a deal that's okay for ourselves but we don't take into consideration the effect on other people. And there's an effect, like there's more congestion, there's more pollution, you know, other things, and that multiplies a lot, considering the number of people. So that's a negative externality, we disregard it. Now suppose you're a, a, an investment banker, say for Goldman Sachs. Uh, you make a transaction, you try to make sure that it works for Goldman Sachs you don't take into account something that's called systemic risk. That is the likelihood that your transaction will crash the whole system. There is such a likelihood, it's constant, uh, but it's underestimated because it's an externality, it's a footnote. Well, you know, that's bad. That's what leads, one of the things that necessarily leads to crises, and it's understood. You can read it in major economic books. Uh, well, you know, that's not, the end of the world. When the system crashes, again, if it was in a capitalist economy, they'd be self-correcting because they'd go out of business. But in our kind of state, which is designed by and uh, for the masters of mankind, uh, the taxpayer comes in and rescues you. Uh, however, uh, so it's not lethal necessarily, harmful, but not lethal. However, there are other cases of externalities where nobody's going to come to the rescue. And one of them is very much on the agenda right now. I'll end with that. Uh, that's destruction of the environment. If you destroy the environment, nobody's going to rescue you. And that is an externality. If you're uh, a CEO, let's say, uh, your task is to ensure that the economy, that the environment is destroyed. That's not an exaggeration. You must act so as to maximize short-term profit and market share. If you don't, in fact, that's a legal obligation in the Anglo-American system. But furthermore, if you don't do it, you'll be kicked out and somebody else will come in who will do it. So it's kind of like an institutional fact about the system. Well, what does that mean? That means you may very well know that the acts you're carrying out will lead to destruction of the environment, but you cannot take that into consideration. If you can't, if you do, you're out. Somebody else is in who does it. And that's not a, that's an externality. The externality in this case is the fate of the species, uh, but nobody is going to come in and take care of that. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. There are big, major campaigns being carried out by the Chamber of Commerce, the biggest business lobby, by American Petroleum Institute and others, uh, to convince people that, uh, that global warming is a liberal hoax. And it's effective. Uh, by now, probably two-thirds of the population either denied that's taking place or doubts it. And that's showing up in Congress. Uh, the new Congress, uh, just about maybe every, cl close to all, maybe all of the new Republicans in the House are global warming deniers. Uh, for what worse still, a lot of them are uh, true believers, like the head of uh, one of the House committees on the environment has uh, informed the world that it can't be a problem, global warming, because uh, God promised Noah that there wouldn't be another flood. Well, you shouldn't laugh. I mean, if this was happening in some tiny remote country somewhere, okay, you could laugh. 
uh, when it's happening in the most — in the richest and most powerful country in human history, you can't laugh. Because if — and furthermore, these guys are acting on those assumptions. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency was instituted by Richard Nixon. He was the last liberal president. That wasn't the — I'm not kidding. Uh, and it's now being destroyed. It's being underfunded. It's being prevented from looking at greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions and so on and so forth. That's a sign of the shift that's taking place, uh, consistent with everything else that I described. That's part of the vicious cycle. And it's going very far. Uh, and if, uh, if this continues, it's, uh, uh, nobody's going to rescue us. That's uh, — it's going to be the end. Well, uh, when we laugh at the, the congressman who's uh, talking about God, talking to Noah, we ought to qualify that laughter by recognizing that the current economic crisis is also the result of fanatic religious belief, belief in the religion that markets know best. Uh, so therefore, the Fed and the economics profession didn't have to notice that the economy is going totally out of whack. You know, Eight trillion dollars of nothing was bolstering the economy. Since we have efficient markets, I have a theorem to prove it, uh, then who cares? You know? Well, crashed. Fortunately, you could be rescued that time, not this time. So we really have a choice. We can either passively observe what's going on and, or try to do something about it. And if we passively observe, you can predict the outcome. Uh, there will be a major destruction, uh, and those who uh, survive will be able to contemplate the outcome. Well, stop there.